I'm talking with Gary Briggle, who has been a longtime friend and collaborator over the years. Gary has appeared in Dayton uh, in many different ways, mostly with Dayton Opera, mostly as a stage director, uh, but uh, on stage as well. You were the witch in Hansel and Gretel and a, a very witchy witch, I, I should say. <laughs> Uh, you would have been on stage as George Frederick Handel in our Baroque uh, opera performance, which got kiboshed by the virus. And you've had a long and, <clears throat> and varied career as a singer, as an actor, as a director. Um, so I think you bring uh, perhaps a, a broader perspective on life in the arts in the COVID era than some of our guests have been. And uh, it's wonderful to see you, uh, even just on a screen. So Gary, can you tell us how you've been, what you've been up to? Uh, how does the world look to you from, uh, from the Twin Cities and the art world there? Well, I have to say, Neil, it fills my heart to see you and hear you. And I have so enjoyed your uh, piano bench conversations and your playing and just, you know, the little ways that we've all learned to adjust to stay connected as friends and colleagues in these challenging times. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. Um, and I have to just thank you too for the rich uh, generosity of your collaborative uh, spirit in the work that we've gotten to do with Dayton Opera, which has been, you know, tremendously rewarding over the past many years now. Um, so thank you for all of that. And for this chance, just to catch up a little bit. Um, here in Minneapolis, um, I can't even say the name of our fair city without uh, acknowledging what we've been through in right. the wake of George Floyd's tragic murder, um, which occurred only blocks from my little house here behind a white picket fence in Southern Minneapolis. Um, Suffice to say, uh, that was terrible and terrifying, and we are in the process of ongoing community healing, um, which has been very gratifying and um, deeply meaningful uh, after all that violence and destruction. Um, we, of course, won't get into the ongoing issues surrounding that tragedy, but um, but suffice to say, we're moving forward in ways that are positive and um, as a community. And in the larger scope of things, Neil, I think it's been pretty stunning to see all of the major institutions, the Guthrie Theater, uh, the Minnesota Opera, the Children's Theater, um, shut down, cut their budgets, fire two thirds of their staff. Um, and so we've all been processing that. Um, the response from my artist friends, of course, who are resilient and amazing, means there have been lawn concerts and porch concerts and parking lot concerts and um, flatbed truck concerts and all of these socially distanced events. Um, gathering steam and momentum, particularly from the musical community. Uh, the singers will not be daunted in, in that ongoing work. So that's been very healing and, and rejuvenating. Um, the theater community, including, you know, the myriad tiny theaters that we have in this town, um, are really struggling. Um, it's interesting to see how benefit events are being organized, um, which I just observe are easier for major institutions than they are for small theaters. Um, but we're trying to hang on and be hopeful and I guess constructively put our heads together about how we proceed. What, is, what does theater and music and opera and ballet look like? Um, I guess nobody's really talking about it until in the early part of next year. But those conversations are underway and 
I got to say, even the conversations and even the brainstorming sessions are encouraging. So maybe that sounds familiar to you folks there. Yes, I think it is very much familiar because that's that's the kind of thing that's going on here as well. I think everyone is is dealing with the shock and the the difficulty of the cancellations and the adjustments um, and the frustrations of trying to trying to move forward when we know that what we used to do is not doable, at least for the short and, and midterm future. Um, but we are, as you well know, uh, by definition, creative, off the wall thinkers. And we're all putting those skills to use trying to figure out, well, given the limitations that we have, what we can do. And, uh, you know, that's something which has been, you know, most of our work has been in, on, in the opera pit and on the opera stage, uh, you know, in, in the opera world, that's what, with the exception of Wagner, who, who dreamed up what the hell he wanted and then found somebody to, to pay for it. Um, that's what we do is we, we think of what our dreams are and then we, we see what can be done and then we figure out how to scale our dreams to the reality that faces us. And then the audience looks at it and says, wow, I didn't know you could do something like that. And we're all thinking, yeah, but if you only saw what we really wanted to do. Right. Uh, so in, in a way, it's the, same, it's the same thing we've always done, but the constraints on us are new and additionally painful. So yeah. it, it obliges us to be even more creative and to respond even more flexibly and with more professional and imaginary imagination agility yes yeah I, I you know we've always prided ourselves here in the musical and musical theater communities um on a sense of uh shared understanding and uh support but boy has that all the things that we assumed about one another are now being acted on and expressed in very much more palpable ways. So I feel like we'll come out of this in certain ways stronger, more um, intentionally unified and more intentionally uh, generous with one another than I think, as I say, we assumed we were in the past. Let's hope. Let's that that would be definitely looking on on the bright side if we can if we can pull that off so the the yeah. thing the immediate cause that brings us together is the rebroadcast on uh, concert night with the Dayton Philharmonic of our collaboration from a few years back of well the full title would have been Berlioz's episode from the life of an artist uh, both part one, known as Symphonie Fantastique, and part two, known as Lelio. So since we're talking about, and I mentioned Wagner, and I should have probably mentioned Berlioz too, as the other person whose dreams were far beyond what uh, the practical world uh, could accommodate. Um, this is perhaps one of the most amazing flights of imagination that anyone ever conceived of. Uh, the backstory, I'll, I'll, for our listeners who, and viewers who don't know it, the backstory being that Berlioz, not speaking a word of English, saw a performance by the Irish actress Harriet Smithson, a Shakespearean actor, who did not speak a word of French, was instantly smitten with her and wanted to marry her and figured that since they didn't speak each other's languages, the only way he could get through to her would be to put it down in music and did it in perhaps the strangest way possible. Yet somehow it worked. I, I, I remember reading somewhere that, you know, somewhere during the, the first, during Lelio, Harriet Smithson had this realization I think he's writing about me. 
And then they ended up actually marrying. Uh, maybe not a long and successful and happy marriage, but to a certain extent, you know, on the, on the scale of crazy ideas coming out of the minds of artistic dreamers, uh, this one is not only just one of the craziest, but it actually worked, at least yeah. it did what it was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, so when, when I came up with the crazy idea of doing these as a, as a combined double bill on a single night, uh, Lelio recalls for an actor, for a narrator, and I could think of no one better than you to embody the uh, the craziness of Hector Berlioz. Uh, and Thank so, you. I think <laughs> yes, absolutely. And so you you came on board as my uh, as my partner in crime for this. Um, so when when I first asked you about this, did you, I mean you you agreed very quickly, but. But did you think this person is crazy? Why do I want to get involved with this crazy rodeo? <laughs> no, no, no. For, for, uh, there were many reasons to jump at the opportunity, Neil. First, of course, we both acknowledge how rare it is to experience Lelio in any way other than in a recording. Um, and I am a Berlioz fan. Um, in junior high school, when asked to write a paper about a, a a, a work of music, I chose the Berlioz Requiem. Oh gosh. Mostly because I was a burgeoning uh, vocal student and knew about the glorious tenor solo Indeed. in that work. And, you know, you, you, you get a recording of that. My parents must have been driven crazy because I played it at full tilt in the basement relentlessly. Um, those tr those brass choruses and you know I mean it's just a, it's a gigantic work of course so um, having done that having sung the role of Benedict in, uh, in Beatrice and Benedict um, his uh, chamber opera his little petty point chamber opera based on Much Ado um, anyway I, you didn't have to twist my arm at all in terms of Berlioz. Um, and, and then, you know, you and I have dreamed up some crazy things and, and seen them to fruition. And um, the integration of theatricality into concert, orchestral work, narration, all of that is very interesting to me um, on any level, whether it's Histoire du Soldat or Peter and the Wolf or, you know, any ways that composers and text relate. So, yeah, I was completely game and gave me a chance to sort of whip up my Berlioz hair and um, do an impersonation. So, um, so in terms of, of the staging of it, the presentation of these two pieces, as I recall, I think for the whole first half of the evening during Symphony Fantastique, you were essentially part of the scenery because I think weren't you? You were seated at a writing desk uh, because yes. Berlioz, in in the story of Symphony Fantastique, Berlioz is not really conscious uh, right. while during the first half. He's uh, he's taken an uh, an insufficiently large dose of opium uh, to kill him and instead is having uh, these strange dreams. So I think we had you just there asleep or slumped uh, while all of this went on, as it were, in your, in your head. <clears throat> and then well, you gave me permission, Neil, to um, even in a chair, in costume, to breathe a certain kind of physical life yes. into that hallucination. Um, I tried not to chew the scenery, but be the scenery. And um, just, to, just to be a presence, to remind the audience that this was a present moment imagining, a kind of living, uh, waking nightmare, if you will. So, you know, the, the, the actor in me, you know, enjoyed the, you know, somehow working within the confines of a big chair was a really interesting physical assignment. Um, and I wanted people, of course, to begin to get to know the character that they were gonna hear from after intermission. Yeah, so if, so if, someone, if someone looked at you during the performance of, of Symphonie Fantastique, 
they would not see just a, a lump of, <laughs> of, of humanity, right. But, right. but that you could, in your own, in your own subtle way, kind of live, live out physically the, the emotion. Uh, yes. and, and then Lelio comes. And then, of course, you are an active character because Lelio happens presumably after Berlioz's artist has recovered or awakened from his, his opium dream. And now he's dealing with being alive when he thought he wouldn't be and yes. still trying to deal with the, the incredible romantic uh, affliction that he has <laughs> from, from his beloved. Um, now, so for some background, um, again, for, mostly for our listeners, because I think you know this, one of the things that made me interested in doing this, besides the fact that I too love Berlioz's music, and when there's a piece of Berlioz like Lelio that I feel I really don't quite understand what the hell is going on, um, that's what gets me even more intrigued, because I know there's something interesting going on, and it's just a matter of putting yourself in the right frame of mind so that you can, you can appreciate it. Um, when I was back before coming to Dayton, when I was the associate conductor of the Milwaukee Symphony, uh, the Milwaukee Symphony did a performance of, Le of Symphony Fantastique and Lelio, and then did a recording of it. And it was, it was a wonderful experience because I could get a sense of what this piece could be but I also got a sense of how, if you didn't make it what it could be, it could be a real dud. Um, <laughs> with you know, no offense to the people involved, but you know, in in that production, there was a situation where the conductor was um, a, a native Czech speaker, uh, spoke some French, but but you know, and sp and Engl I mean, his English is way better than my Czech, um, but without a, an idiomatic feeling for the language. Um, the actor who was playing the narrator in Lelio was none other than uh, Werner Klemperer, who our, our Americans know as Colonel Klink from Hogan's Heroes, but was a, a wonderful actor and uh, appeared many times on the operatic stage in speaking roles. And uh, so, you know, his English is good, but again, not a native English speaker. And the text that was being used was word for word the, the rather awkward translation that was into English from the French that was printed in the score. So there was just all these lines that really made no sense to certainly to a modern English speaker's ear. And it was so frustrating. And I thought, you know, if only the text had been better, this thing really would have flown and, and taken off. And so I sort of stuck that idea in my back pocket and thought, well, when you have your own orchestra, you're going to do this and you're going to do it right. So that was the, the impulse for doing it. And it's, the, it's another impulse why I thought you would be a great collaborator, because the notion of taking this, this text, which is which was purple enough in French, <laughs> and then became even more purple and convoluted in the, in the clunky English translation. Uh, the notion of attacking it with someone like you, who, who is so wonderful with words, that we, I knew that we could wrestle this into a shape that would work. And I think we did. Oh, I thought it was a, a very interesting process together, Neil, to honor the original French, um, to honor, uh, and, and I, you know, you and I both have worked in this way before, the, the gradual evolution of a text from a literalness in a foreign language to something that is um, clear um, and immediate um, to an English speaking American audience is a, a, a challenge and a joy. So yes, I, I enjoyed, um, the two of us rolling up our sleeves to work on the text together. Yeah, I mean, and the whole process of, you know, because I went back being, I mean, not a native, but a pretty good French speaker from all the years. I, I, I took it throughout uh, junior high and high school and then living in France for a couple of years. Uh, you know, I, I felt comfortable going back to the original and, and just creating a translation from that and then comparing the, 
the English and then we, we massaged it a lot. Um, mm -hmm. But that, you're right, that whole process of translation is such an interesting topic. Um, I don't know if you know, there's a, what I think is just an amazing um, book by Douglas Hofstadter called Le Tombeau de Marot. Do you know that book? Yes, I do. Uh, which is, uh, if you don't know it, uh, it's, it's a challenge to read, but, it, but it's worth it for, for our listeners. Um, but it's, a, it's about the act of translation. And he starts with this very, very odd, delicate, beautiful, little strange poem in French and then uses that as the jumping off point for this investigation of what translation is all about. And in doing so, does multiple translations of this poem in different ways and gets his friends involved and, and you see this whole thing transformed. And, it, and until I read that book, I don't think I'd ever really pondered just what a deep act translation is. Um, Truly. And it, it really made me think about it. And of course, you know, you, you deal with that in the opera world all the time, because even if, even if you're performing an opera in the original language as a director, I imagine you probably do your own translation for yourself, if for no other reason than for the supertitles. So you, <laughs> you have to deal with that question of, you know, what does, what does the text say? What does it mean? How do you communicate that to an audience that speaks a different language in a way that they will understand it, but also get the emotional content and the and the deep subtext of of the original language? And it it really it's a minefield. Yes, but well, again, I, it, when you pull I it off, through. you think you've done something. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I come through the directing. I come to directing as a singer actor. And um, certainly I was taught that it's crucial to um, come up with your own, every singer must have their own singer's translation. And that feeds right into my directing translation. And you know, my operatic career began with the Minnesota Opera Company that sang everything in English. Um, and so works that were not in English to begin with, um, all of us in the room with Wesley Balk in those days were invited to the collaborative process to turn the Marriage of Figaro or the Barber of Seville or, you know, whatever it was, um, Love for Three Oranges, um, into singable translations, uh, which was, of course, a thrilling collaborative process. So, yeah, that's been a trajectory in my work. Um, so any, any final thoughts on uh, the, the Berlioz uh, Symphony Fantastique Lelio project? Well, just, um, just a, an expression of how exhilarating it is um, to share with you uh, a work like Lelio, which is transformed for the audience as an experience by the careful uh, honing of a narration which shines a light on the work that you know without it as you say could be a bit of a perhaps um, dramatic head scratcher that's not to say that the music itself isn't marvelous but um, but this total experience um, is a rare and wonderful thing to be a part of and I just loved you know there was no fourth wall I was really direct addressed to the audience it was wonderful to look into their faces and see them light up with um, sort of the aha moment to moment of the journey. And then as everyone will see, um, the interaction ultimately with you and with the orchestra at the end um, was very satisfying. Yeah, it was. It was, it was a wonderful experience. I mean, it's interesting uh, because we, we have a, a rubric under which we we survey musicians after every performance to get their input. And um, the musician's reaction to it was, was very different from, from yours and mine, uh, <laughs> because uh, Lelio is definitely something unfamiliar. Um, it's something where in some cases, the orchestra really plays a sort of takes a back seat. I mean, there's, a, there's one beautiful number that's just tenor and piano and the orchestra sits there 
sits there listening to it. And then the stretches of dialogue and the chorus is involved. And the thing that I think is, is most unsettling for them in many different ways is the fact that, you know, for most of them, until they got to that week when we rehearsed and performed the piece, Symphony Fantastique for them is a piece that closes a concert. And so when Symphony Fantastique is, is on the repertoire, there's something on the first half, but you are psyching yourself up for the emotional and the technical challenges of that piece. And to many of them, just the whole notion of, you know, why would you do anything after Symphony Fantastique? You're supposed to go home after, <laughs> after doing that piece. And, you know, the fact that there's a second half that nobody ever plays is, 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 a, is, is a whole other thing. And, you know, in my response to the musicians afterwards, I said, you know, I absolutely, I understand where you're coming from. And I promise you that the next time we play Symphony Fantastique, it will be, the, be at the end of a program. <laughs> it will be as you, you know, it doesn't always have to be this way, but this is what Berlioz had in mind. And this is what he imagined. Um, and so I thought at least once we should have the opportunity to perform it that way. And at least once our audience should have the opportunity to, to experience it. And through this rebroadcast, they get to, kind of re-experience re it without the visuals, of course. Well, and as a colleague, Neil, I, I certainly realized this was my once in a lifetime experience with you as well. So again, I thank you for it. It was tremendously rich and, um, and engaged in a kind of high wire act, in fact, for me, I felt, um, which, you know, I'll, I'll step up to that mark anytime, especially if it's with you, so thank you. The, the flying Wallenda of the, uh, of the Schuster Center. Well, yes. So one, one final question that I've really always wanted to ask you, um, and again, you have the perspective as, as an actor, as a stage director for drama, as a singer, as a stage director for opera, uh, and as a concert performer too. Um, so there's that old adage about comedy is, uh, tragedy is easy, comedy is hard. Now, at Dayton Opera, you have directed plenty of both. I mean, you've di directed Gilbert Sullivan, you've directed The Barber of Seville and The Marriage of Figaro, which is kind of in between. Um, but, uh, but you've also directed tragedies as well. So my question is, is, is it true also for a stage director that, that making a comedy come alive on stage is in some ways easier, uh, making a, is, is in some ways much harder than making a tragedy come alive on stage. Oh, I don't know how to express how difficult comedy is in the opera house, except to tell you that I have had people march across the aisle at a comic opera and put their hand over my mouth because I was laughing. <laughs> um, in fact, it's, we... tremendous, it's tremendously difficult because um, timing, <laughs> um, which in, in a certain respect, opera is all about time and how the composer uses time. Um, and some composers, Mozart, Rossini, have a great comic timing, others less so. Um, and giving the audience sufficient permission, as my mentor Wesley Balk used to say, if they don't laugh in the first 45 seconds of a comic opera, they will never laugh again. <laughs> so I don't care whether that's, you know, a banana peel or whatever it needs, or a poo-poo cushion or, you know, a pie in the face, but you've got to give the audience permission and an invitation all night long to relax enough to enjoy the comedy and to understand that in great comic opera, um, there's time, there's reaction time built in, that the next thing that happens after a good laugh isn't gonna be very important because, you know, we're moving on. So um, yeah, it's particularly difficult in the opera house. And yeah, you're right, I guess, because, you know, there are, there are so many, I mean, barriers is too strong a word, but there, there are so many layers of gunk in a way between the
the work and the audience in opera. There can be the the perceived seriousness of what opera is. And let's not yes. even talk about the super titles, right. which confound us all. Right. And the language and the and the synopsis where you know opera synopses are always written in this English that nobody speaks with multiple convoluted sentences, you know, the the huntsman who previously had been seen in, 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 you know, in his later hosen jumping up and down, you know, by the time you're three words into a sentence, you don't remember who they're talking about in the synopsis. So I, I think you're right that the notion of, and I, as you were saying that I was, I was thinking of the project that we're slated to work on this together, this coming season, Don Giovanni for, for Dayton Opera, of course, is, you know, it has this, this overture to begin with, which is both, serious at the beginning and then sprightly and then it goes into this incredibly intense opening scene where you know don giovanni kills donna anna's there's a fight he kills the and there's this big thing and then the first the first line that comes out of that in the recitative leporello says in italian of course he says who's dead you were the old man and it it just you've had this tremendously intense tragic serious thing and then he kind of you know it's, it's kind of just what you said it's not in the first 45 seconds but that line is the whoopee cushion that mm -hmm. says it's not all going to be like this there's going to be some of the other stuff in here too and mozart and de ponte knew that same that same thing just how important it is to get people laughing yes yeah and and you know my sensibilities are to to live with the piece, whatever it is, so that that comedy is somehow intrinsic, not tacked on, not applied, but somehow comes out of character and situation. Um, because then, then you've tapped into the actual wellspring of comedy that will serve you all night long. Absolutely. Well, Gary, it's been so nice to talk to you about all kinds of things, including... <laughs> Symphony Fantastique and Lelio. And uh, believe me, I, I look forward to the day when we can see each other in three dimensions and be working on a project for live performance for a live audience. Lord knows when that will be, but it will be at some point and I hope we'll all be there for it. Well, thank you, Neil. I, I, again, thank you for all the ways that what you're doing as, as an artist um, keep hope alive, keep joy alive, keep music in our life. And um, as your friend, um, reaching across time and distance and, and keeping our hands in each other's keeping is um, very meaningful to me. So thank you and uh, all the best to the uh, DPAA audiences and personnel. Um, I miss you all very much and look forward to seeing you again as soon as possible. Indeed. Take care. Be safe, Gary. We'll see you Thank soon. Thank you, Neil. All the best to you. You too. Bye-bye.